GM, GM, welcome to Web3 Academy, your one trusted source to capitalize on the next big phase of the internet. Don't get caught in the hype cycle. I'm Jay Bird, and I believe that the internet of ownership is going to change the world. That's why I'm guiding doers on a path to build and invest in Web3. Today on the show, we have Josh Neuroth joining us. Josh is the VP of product at Anchor. And Anchor is probably the biggest Web3 company that you have never heard of. Unless you're a builder, unless you're a dev, I should say, you might not know Anchor because Anchor is the infrastructure company behind Web3. The best analogy for Anchor is they're the AWS of Web3. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when AWS first started, Nobody knew about Amazon Web Services, and now they're one of the fastest growing companies in the world. Well, Anchor is on that trajectory, but they're just in the early days. They've grown from only a few people five years ago when Josh joined. Josh was one of the first team members to join to over 130 today. Their token is one of the top app tokens, one of the top tokens that is actually a service-based company token, not a blockchain token. So these guys are doing stuff. And Josh brings a really interesting perspective to today's show because of the seat he sits in at Anchor is he gets to see a lot of the base layer of the way we are interacting with blockchain, who is interacting with blockchain around the world, what countries are interacting with blockchain, And what types of interactions are we looking to do? And how is the increased complexity of the interactions and the use cases that we are building on blockchain, what is that leading to? And so we dive into so much in today's show. We talk at the beginning, actually, which is a great chat about the current trends and where Josh sees everything in Web3 now and in the future. And then we dive into Anchor, what they are building. We talk about what it's like to work with Polygon, Binance, Optimism, Aave, Avalanche. These are all chains that Anchor supports. And what does that look like from the inside? We also talk about Anchor's recent partnership with Microsoft and Tencent and what that has led to in terms of Microsoft, Tencent, two of the largest companies in the world, two largest Web2 companies in the world, How does that open doors and how does that help Anchor reach new enterprises? And Josh also tells us how it's leading them to work with governments and what that looks like. What are governments trying to build and how are governments planning to use blockchain in order to offer services, to offer new stable coins to their citizens? So we dive into that as well and so, so much more in this episode. Just Really, Josh, because of his, he's been in the space for five years as a builder, these are the type of people that we love to have on the show because they've seen a few cycles. They understand the perspective of what it's like to build in Web3, not just invest in Web3. Josh himself is an avid investor in Web3, so we touch on that. He actually gives some investment advice in this show, which is really great to hear not many of guests are willing to do that. Josh is a no-bullshit guy, that's for sure, and a no-hype guy as well. But he also really focuses on the importance of putting yourself in a position to build in Web3 and in new tech. And what does that mean? How do you do that? So really excited for you to hear this show. Let's dive in. But before we do, we'll just take a minute to hear from our sponsor. The future of social media is here, and that future lives in Web3 on top of Lens Protocol. Web2 social platforms are broken and ripe for disruption. You see, the epicenter of social media is the creators, and yet they are the most neglected. Web2 platforms like Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram are all essentially robbing creators of their worth. Creators are a new type of entrepreneur, forming new types of businesses. Yet with Web2 platforms, creators don't own their content or their profiles, and that's their product and business. Instead, they are tied to the platforms they choose to create on. Well, just like how crypto is freeing us from banks, Web3 is freeing us from these centralized platforms. On Lens Protocol, creators own their content, own their profile, 
and even their social graph and followers in the form of NFTs. This allows you to move freely from one social application to another with your content, profile, and followers moving along with you. Lens Protocol enables self-sovereignty for your social graph and interoperability across the internet. At Web3 Academy, we believe this is the future of social, and that's why we partner with Lens to ensure that the path of social media is heading in the right direction. Visit lens.xyz to learn more today. Did you know that Web3 users lose billions of dollars every year due to phishing attacks? If you've been in this space long enough, then you or someone you know has probably fallen victim to one of these scams. This is why we've partnered with WAG, your guardian in this digital wilderness. WAG is a tool designed to help you spot the difference between malicious links and legit ones. With WAG, you can rest easy knowing that every link you click on is safe. This is an absolute game changer for Web3. As part of our partnership with WAG, we'll be using their platform to create verifiable links so that our community feels safe, knowing that what they're clicking on is the real deal. And if you don't have a community to protect and you're just looking to protect yourself, WAG has you covered with safe stops, which tell you exactly who created the link you're clicking on. Head to the link in the description, click it, see that it's verified by Web3 Academy, and start protecting yourself today. Just use the code FREE1000 when signing up, and if you're among the first 1,000 users, you'll get free access for life. Josh, what's going on? Welcome to the show. Hey, hey, thanks for having me. Really excited to have you. Anchor's been on my radar from the beginning, and we're going to dive into everything you guys are building at Anchor. I feel like you guys are the biggest Web3 company that nobody knows about, and so we're going to explain that. But before we dive in there, just give us the background. Who is Josh? Why did you get into Web3? What's inspiring and exciting you every day about this space? Yeah, well, my personal story, I've basically grown up on the internet in the 90s, and I think there's something that was so special about kind of what I would call web 1.0, where it was the, you know, the Yahoo, the geo cities kind of era of the internet with eBay. Some of that like community driven approach was frankly lost in, in the social era in web two. And so I had always kind of wanted to find how can we make this open democratic decentralized system that really lives on the internet is open for everyone, lower barrier entries. And I, and I found that in web three. And so that was my personal reason for getting into this space. And I had met the Anchor co-founders very early on in their journey of starting Anchor and started doing it, working with Anchor as a consultant and then moved on full time. And so it's been almost five years now. It's been an amazing journey. Have watched this space. I mean, when I effectively joined Anchor, like Ethereum was only three years old then. And so <laughs> it's almost been kind of watching this grow up in addition to watching Anchor grow up. And so Anchor has gone from about eight people at the time when I met the team there to not, now we're almost 130 people on, an, on our staff. So wow, uh, we've got massive growth on that. And what do we do at Anchor? Well, we are an infrastructure provider that kind of sits behind DeFi. It sits behind the apps that, you know, the exchanges, the NFT exchanges, the some of the DeFi websites out there and a lot more builders in this space. And we empower them with a toolbox of developer tools that make it easy to build and interact with Web3. So we've been growing. We grow as the, as the space grows and the space is growing like crazy right now. That's nice to hear. It's nice to hear the space is growing right, crazy right now. Like I know that, right? But so many of us are in the space from an investment perspective, right? It's only natural that when you are building an economy and everything is an asset, you're not just a running a business or working in the space. You're also an investor and the roller coaster ride of that has just been tumultuous to say the least. I want to go back to your point here. You mentioned open and decentralized. We talk about that on the podcast. I think anybody that is currently in Web3 values those things. But the rest of the world, do they really care about decentralization? Do they really care about an open internet? I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm curious. What is it about a decentralized internet or an open internet that you see as making a better internet? What does that do for users, for everyday people when they do come into Web3? Let me take that in a, a little bit different direction. I think the people that care most about having an open internet are entrepreneurs. And the internet has been one of the greatest wealth creating tools ever in the history of civilization. Let me give you an example. Like if you were to try to launch a social media 
company today. Maybe there's a kind of a niche, a niche that you want to get into. If you have any kind of traction, you will immediately be copied by, you know, Meta or TikTok by Dance, right? Like you have almost no chance in that space. I mean, there is some smaller chance to have some traction, but I really believe in the power of entrepreneurship. And, you know, it's really interesting because, you know, being in North America, you and I are both based in North America. Like there's probably a lot of businesses that we could create in the offline world that could be pretty successful. But for many people in developing countries, the internet is really their only chance of having a good business to start. And so the entrepreneurial nature of Web3 and what it's enabling in the entrepreneur space is, is one of the most important things to me. So to answer your original question, does the average person, internet user, really care about an open and decentralized web? Not Probably not really, but I think the entrepreneurs in the space really, really care about that. And we've seen that with artists getting into NFTs, right? Now they don't have as many gatekeepers. They can sell their art directly to users. We've seen that with people creating DAOs. My definition for Web3 is it's a collection of tools and internet technologies that that really enables communities to be organized in a way that's very meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. And that has not been the case in, in many of the other internet models and internet businesses that we've seen with data being exploited and privacy being exploited. So I'm most excited about the open web for the sake of entrepreneurship and the sake of growth around the world. You're so right. It's so easy for us in North America. I'm in Canada. You're in, in the US. We have access to commerce. We have access to building businesses. We have access to a legal system, to structures, to regulation that allows us to create a corporation and then to get customers, whereas so many people around the world don't. And not only that, I don't really want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but it just, it just sparked my mind on this, is we also have access to identity and we also have access to banking, which 3 billion people do not have access to. And so Web3, we often forget that Web3 is solving those things as well. And for a lot of people, those are basic rights that will significantly improve their life. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so people that don't have access to those services, like how are they going to get access to them? In most cases, I think it's going to end up coming through Web3. So mm -hmm. We're already seeing that, the growth. So something I get to see that's really, really interesting is, is an RPC provider, which we can go into what that means later. But basically, we provide a connection for builders to the blockchain. And so we have you know basic logs that tell us kind of where growth is happening. And I see billions of requests from countries like Argentina, from mm -hmm. Turkey. We even got someone from Antarctica peeing our infrastructure the other day. We see people in sub-Saharan Africa both builders and just traders, it's really cool to see kind of this global growth. And especially when you start meeting teams in Web3, mm -hmm. there really isn't a headquarters of Web3. There are cities that are very strong in Web3, like Paris, New York, and you know, Lisbon and Portugal, but it's very distributed or even decentralized in that mm -hmm. nature as well. Did you get somebody from Antarctica? Yeah, we think it was someone that was using our RPC in their wallet. You know, you can add your an RPC connection in your like MetaMask wallet or similar wallet. And yeah, you know, probably someone was on a research tool and decided to do some trading while they were or they were on a research trip and or a tourist trip and was trading while they were on it. So, <laughs> Unbelievable. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's incredible. Since you brought up uh, social media as an example of uh, businesses, I'm curious as you know, because I haven't figured this out yet, but Threads just launched. This episode is coming, airing on uh, Wednesday. We're recording this on Friday. So people will be listening to this about five days after we record this, but we're very close to the launch of Threads. I don't know if you've played around on Threads, but the one thing that has stood out to me is they've talked about how they're building it on the Fediverse. And I don't even know what the Fediverse is. I don't know if you know, but it seems like Threads is taking a step in the direction of a interoperable social graph. Do you have any thoughts on that? Do you know anything about that? Have you dove into that at I all? I don't really know too much about how they're architecting Thread yeah. in the background or where the direction is going. You know, at the end of the day, like I did sign up for it and kind of checked it out. At the end of the day, it's like still asking you for basically as a disclaimer that literally all of your personal data is being shared, you know, with Meta. And so 
Meta is constantly thinking about how do we release these beautiful, easy to use products that extract data from our users. So that part is still the same, regardless of what they say is surrounding it. They want to get better at serving us ads and understand even like what we might be interested in in the future. So that's the only reason they're doing this. There is no altruistic reason that Meta has for launching threads, but to get more data and more users in their web. It's a great reminder. It's a necessary evil right now in my mind, because there is an incredible connection that we get from these social media platforms and they've served a great purpose in our life. It's unfortunate that their business model became what it is. Anyways, let's not go down that rabbit hole right now. Okay. I want to touch on, you're at an interesting place. You sort of mentioned this, even just knowing that somebody from Antarctica is interacting with Web3. Like you have this like, I don't know what analogy you want to use, backseat or, you know, this ground layer. Like you see things that the rest of us don't see. What's sort of your outlook right now or your perspective right now? Maybe you can give us an analogy to help us understand the way you see it. Yeah, so Anchor really sits at this interesting intersection in the space where you could think about it like we're almost like the air traffic controller at an airport. We see mm. the planes landing, we see the travelers, you know, boarding the planes. That's where we sit. So from the practical side, we've integrated over 30 different blockchains and that grows literally every single week as we've onboarded more and more new chains in the space and then our customers are developers that are working in enterprises. Some of them now are in government organizations. Others are building NFT collections and others are just traders. So we have this like really interesting view of like the multi-chain space, but then also the different types of builders and different types of users in the space. So once you kind of see that and you're talking to these people as customers and users, you start seeing a more, I'd say, realistic view of what's happening that's not grounded in hype, but mm. grounded in like this very practical approach to that. Thank you. <laughs> we, see, we see that view more often. Maybe you could start a podcast actually from your data and <laughs> share that with us on a regular basis. The no hype podcast. I mean, we, we tell about it. Don't don't mean, I'm, the hype setter. I'm literally going to look that up. <laughs> see, <laughs> nice. Nice. Okay. So there's a few ways we can take this. What trends are you seeing maybe from, if you want to focus on the use case side? I mean, you mentioned governments, you mentioned enterprise. I know that you guys are building out SDKs for gaming. Like, is there any use cases that you're seeing a lot of trends on? Or the other way we can approach this is any trends that you're seeing tech around. Before we hit record, you were talking about ZK proofs. I'm down to go down any of these paths that you are now, you know, seeing from your seat and that as that air traffic controller. Thank you. I think, you know, it's July, 2023. Ethereum has officially transitioned to proof of stake. Let's just back up and like, look at where we're at. So mm -hmm. two years ago, we saw crypto, at least in the US dollar value, hits around 3 trillion, what, 2.5, some 2.5 billion to 3 trillion, somewhere in there. And then, you know, right now we're sitting at 1.2 trillion. So I think investors are like, oh, what's happening? We've seen these major failings like the FTX failing. Basically all of the speculative hype has kind of dried up, which is it really has been a great healthy thing for this space. But if you back out and you kind of look at the trend lines, things are growing. One of the things that I love to look at is there's a company, it's part of the S&P 500 called Equinix. I'll tell you why I'm telling you this story, but there's this company that's called Equinix and they are sitting at the interconnection space of really the cloud, the data centers, the telecom companies, and they help most organizations that do business like the Netflixes of the world, the digital oceans of the world, the Amazons of the world. They do business with Equinix. Well, if you look at Equinix, they just celebrated a 25 year anniversary. And if you look at their stock price, you saw in 1999 or 2000, their stock went up to like $700, $800, something like that, $600. It was somewhere in that range. And then it went all the way down to like $50. And then it's just been kind of a straight linear growth since then till now they surpassed the market cap that they had in 1999. And I think that it ends up being kind of an analogy for what has happened in crypto. It's very similar to kind of that dot-com burst or bubble and burst where there's so much speculative, 
These tokens are getting insane valuations because so many new people are coming in. There's so much buy pressure. If Web3 wasn't really well known in 2017, that's when tech people started getting into it, early adopters. By 2021, we really saw kind of everyone had heard of Bitcoin more or less. Not everyone, but you know everyone that's kind of in this trading sphere or puts disposable income into assets, right? So, you know, now we're seeing these protocols, these projects, these companies really start to justify their valuations. That's the stage we're in right now. And so I think the market is slowly growing. You know, we've had some rough times in the last two years, but we've seen more healthy valuations for protocols and chains out there, and we continue to grow in that space. So that has been happening, but in order for there to be truly true organic and sustainable growth, the user experience has to get better and companies in the space have to make money, right? There has to be like real utility, not just like, oh, the token's used for this, but like it actually has to work. The model has to work, has to be self-sustaining. I think like what I've seen happening in our customers and the, you know, the partners that we work with is that people are really starting to make advancements in the technology side that are growing and, you know, kind of justifying their valuations in this space. So the the ZK technology is part of that. We can get into that a little bit, but I think it's been healthy. And what we're probably seeing now in crypto is less volatility, more of a linear growth. I think there could be, you know, Bitcoin, the Bitcoin happening is next year. Mm-hmm. I think the March, April kind of time frame that will definitely push our market up, I think, my mm-hmm. personal opinion. But all of the altcoins and the alt tokens are really kind of fighting for, you know, survival and they're growing their revenue, they're growing their teams. And the, the results are are really great. I mean, a lot of this is self-sustaining ecosystem now. So the valuations are, are a lot more normal now. So that's been a good thing. We don't see, you know, we kind of joke that ETH Denver of 2022. So it was February of 2022. Like there's a protocol that spent you know, $800,000 in their after party, right? They had a top five DJ open bar for like 5,000 people or something like that for like oh, yeah. hours. Those days aren't here. You know, people are just having these meetups at bars and, you know, with a panel and a little projector, you know, we're back to that kind of place, but that's been great. You know, that's been great. All the distractions are kind of, there's still some still are still there, but we've minimized distractions and really focused on buildings in the space. You make a good point. The party is a great analogy because when you have a party like that, which we had in 2021 and early 2022, Everybody wants to be there and they don't necessarily care about building community. They don't care about the long term. They're just, hey, I heard this party is sweet and I can benefit from it. Right. Right. And that's not what you need when you build. One thing we talk a lot about on the show is the challenges you face when you are building in new tech. When you're a business or an entrepreneur or builder in new tech, you're not just building your business, you're also building infrastructure. You're also teaching your customers and your users about this yep. new tech. You're also likely involved in the underlying tech by going to East Denver. You're involved in the chains. You're trying to understand the protocols. Everybody's trying to create new standards as well, and then get everybody to follow those standards. They get so many things that are happening. For you guys over at Anchor, I know you have a token. What's it been like to manage the expectations of having a token versus the objective of building a sustainable and profitable business? Absolutely want to talk about that. That's a great segue. So I think, you know, a lot of crypto projects that have tokens, more or less, sure, governance tokens you know, whatever. But the startup journey for crypto projects is very similar to other startups where you're trying to find traction. You're trying to find what grows this thing. You can't just have a vision and just say, okay, here we go. Like you got to- You what? can if you're you a PFP project or you could, you sure, could have, right. You could have, <laughs> you could have for, you could have for a while, but, but to build an actual sustainable thing, there's a lot of little micro pivots that have to be made We've released products and then turned them down. We've told the community, our community, we're doing one thing and then moved to something 
slightly different. And that's not to mislead them. That's so, so that anchor grows and it survives and it, you know, keeps being a force in this space a force for infrastructure and keeps connecting the dots, you know, for the ecosystem, for our customers. That journey is a, probably a healthy journey. And I think everyone in the space that's going to succeed it, their journey is going to look like that. Now, I will say that for us, we really, at the end of the day, are an incentive, pro, incentive protocol and a service provider. And I think if you look at it, like who's capturing the most value in the space, it's the actual chains themselves, like Bitcoin, like Ethereum, like Polygon, et cetera, et cetera. And as a service provider, it's like service providers, definitely there's probably five or six in the top 100 on coin market cap. They can't have a place there, but it's a lot harder to bring token utility as a service provider, right? And so that it's definitely something we're exploring is how do you become more of a chain that has utility? And we've really seen the space heading and kind of where we want it to go in order to enable that. So still too early to really talk through like the details of that, but that's where we're heading with the anchor token is more into the chain space. And mm. especially as we get into kind of like this idea of layer twos and layer threes in the space, we think we can add a lot of value by having all the pieces connected. The other thing I want to say is that you started this conversation by saying, you know, we're the top uh, infrastructure provider that no one's heard of. And I, I would have to say like a good analogy to that is like Amazon Web Services Amazon Web Services more or less started in like 2008, 2009, that kind of time period. And now now it's just a basic tool that almost every business uses. And, you know, we're 15-ish years later. And so it's taken a long time for them to grow. And obviously, they are probably one of the fastest growing organizations on the planet right now. But these infrastructure plays like Anchor is, is they snowball over time. And as you connect more and more of the pieces you build better and better tools for your customers and your users, you know, you get bigger and bigger with that. And so definitely something that, you know, we are in that growth stage right now. I will say though, that our token has been on the market for five years and there's challenges that we have with that as well. All of our supply is out there in the market today. There's challenges with that. And we probably have to figure out a way to decrease our supply in the future and for it to really have a meaningful utility in our protocol. I don't want to use the word regret, but do you think it would have been better to not have launched the token back then? I mean, there's so many challenges that come with having a token that impacts your balance sheet when you're trying to build a business and all of a sudden your token is valued way less, not because you did anything differently, just because the whole market crashed and Sam Bankman Freed went and stole everybody's money. You know, like all these things are totally external to what you're building. How do you manage that? I think that's something that like a lot of builders and founders in this space really struggle with is those, the impact of the external on their business, both from a mental health perspective, but also from like a balance sheet perspective. Yeah. Well, I've heard someone told me the other day that we're like an OG project in this space. It's not that old, but I guess compared to a lot of others, we are an OG project in this space or OG token in space. We've kind of consistently hovered around like 120 in coin market cap and position in terms of market caps, but we've significantly grown from where we started at like 200 in that space. So there's been long-term growth on our market cap in relative to these other chains and, and protocols out there. I think the market is very, very different now. So when we launched the choking in 2017, 2018, there were almost no VCs investing in the space. So you kind of had to launch a token. Now it seems like the model that most people are doing is they're creating two entities. They create more or less a service provider entity. They have an equity round. They bring in their VCs. Sometimes those VCs buy the token as accredited investors, kind of as a, as a pre-sale, right? And then later they have a second foundation or DAO or something that launches the token almost like as a nonprofit. So there are kind of models, I think best practices that didn't exist in 2017 or 2018. The industry is adopting, which had been healthy you know, at the end of the day, I do want to say this, that like, if you look at the space right now, I think one thing traders often ask me is, you know, where do you see the opportunities in the space? So I do think it's important to realize that if you're trying to be, if you're not just investing in Bitcoin or Ethereum, you know, you're investing in these other kind of alts and whatnot, that they are all kind of in this, more or less this early stage, right? And so Myself, I, I've done you know, angel investing and whatnot in the equity side with other startups. And 
it's just like a risk. It's a risky business, right? Investing in early stage things. Like, and some of the other angel investors I know, they expect seven out of 10 investments not, not to succeed or, you know, to die off. And they're counting on, you know, one to three. And so I think, you know, that that is kind of how the altcoin space is right now. And that's the truth. There's not a lot of people that will say that um, publicly that work in the space, but a lot of the chains are slowly dying. And the thing about Web3 is that I'd say the the double-edged sword is that there are these amazing opportunities from the builder side. There are amazing opportunities from the investor side, but there also are going to be a lot of like slow burns. In Web2, if you try a business, you bring in investors, that business doesn't work, you shut it down and move on to the next thing. In Web3, sometimes those projects maybe live on too long mm. when they really don't have a viable path forward. But in any regard, I think Anchor is in a great place. You know, we've worked hard at finding product market fit, at improving our cash flow so that we don't have to sell our token to survive. And, you know, that's been a really important thing for us. That's the intro for your the, your podcast, the No Hype Podcast with Josh Newroth telling you what nobody else in the space will say. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. We, we actually just published a report for our paid subscribers a few weeks ago talking about how to strategically and confidently invest in apps and in the service providers in the space. And we talked a lot about exactly what you're saying is that it's it's very challenging. It's very risky investments. Yes, there will be a few that are the next AWS. They'll be the AWS of Web3. And I think we all believe that Web3 will be the base layer of the internet in the next decade. So yeah, you might get that, but there's also a good chance that you might get somebody that nobody yeah. ever heard, oh, heard of. Look, all the 100x opportunities in the space now, you really have to be a core, someone that's involved in the project itself. So it's going to be almost impossible to find those from just like the trader side. Now, there are stories I see on Reddit and r slash cryptocurrency of people that, you know, have made, you know, 100x, 1000x on, you know, some of the meme coins that recently came out. But there's like out of every one person that you know did that, there's a million that lost money, right? So, yeah. <laughs> and the um, million that lost money, they're not talking about it. They're not getting well. Not, exactly. Nobody hears their story. Yeah, and so I think what's been really interesting is the the barrier to entry in the space has gone down significantly. And so one thing that makes me excited is there's easier and easier tooling out there to get involved. There's uh, DAOs that are compensating people with airdrops and whatnot. There's no code tools that are starting to you know come out. And so what makes me most excited is the entrepreneurial nature. And so I think for people that want to make money in this space, the best place to do it is to try to do something entrepreneurial in, in the Web3 space and get involved in a project and you know join with others or do something yourself and try to figure it out. That's where the real good opportunities are these days. Amen. I love that. Everybody just wants the thousand X without the work, but really yeah. you just got to put in the work. Okay. So let's check about ZK proofs. We haven't talked a ton about that on the podcast, mainly because it's just so technical. Can you explain ZK proofs as if you're explaining it to a five-year-old <laughs> and then maybe help us all understand and then maybe lead towards like, why does this matter? And what are the use cases that this will enable? Man, hard question. Let me start with some of the use cases that I think ZK can enable just to ground us in that. So ZK stands for zero knowledge. It's a very mathematical concept of basically how do you prove that something exists in a decentralized system and that thing could be an asset, um, a contract. It could be, you know, that some activity exists. That ends up being really, really important. So well, the Web3 space right now has a lot of workarounds for what I might call trying to make a better user experience. So like, let's take two examples of those. So in one workaround that is kind of clunky is the bridging, the bridging assets from one chain to another. So for example, you know, maybe you bought some Polygon ERC20, which is their Ethereum token, and you want to get Polygon native or the native token, you have to you know, use the bridge for that. Or maybe you're trying to move your ETH from Ethereum to a DeFi project that lives on Binance chain. So you need to use a bridge for that, right? Or go through Binance as an exchange. There's kind of these workarounds that really end up hurting the user experience. Like 
bridges have been kind of the number one way that assets have been hacked besides phishing, or there's been these big exploits on the bridges. So bridges are really a terrible thing in the space. They're a necessary evil right now. On the other side, you know, on DeFi, you have liquidity pools and certainly people make money on liquidity pools. They're also easily exploited if there's any other things going on. You know, multi-chain has some issues today, yesterday, and, uh, you know, liquidity pools had to be paused because of those issues across the space, including at Anchor. It's clunky and zero knowledge, what it can do is it can kind of eliminate that clunkiness. And so today, if you're trading on DeFi, you're effectively, you know, swapping assets, putting assets into liquidity pools, and you're seeing things like impermanent risk and the slippage and all these different things that you're seeing. Now with ZK, DeFi protocols will be able to build order books so we can basically bring the experience of like a Binance or a Coinbase into DeFi, which will be amazing. Mm -hmm. And then with bridges, we can bridge assets kind of seamlessly and in the background with our with CK proofs. So I just think of like better user experience equals zero knowledge. Now it's not the only thing that will make better user experience, security, apps, better wallet integration in, in wallets in things. Exactly. So I'll save you some technical details. That's why I'm excited about it is because I think it can really make this technology feel seamless and, and more of that Web2 experience. So that's why we're racing towards. And, and to bring back my earlier point, well, these valuations, in order to have a better valuation in a lot of these chains and protocols, they they really need more users. They need more activity. And they, in order to do that, they're going to have to have a better user experience. So a lot of this stuff is trying to solve the core issues. And I think everyone in the space that's building is like breathing a sigh of relief. Like I kid you not, I know a, a builder that's built, been part of like 20 projects and kind of when the bear market started, he was like, oh, this is so great. Now we can focus on doing all these things that we've needed to do for forever, you know, because yeah. look, the builders in space, we know the activity is coming back. We are confident in the future of this thing and this industry and this ecosystem, but it's going to take more time to get there. When we just talk about the growth in this space right now, and we do a monthly AMA in our Discord where we talk about what are the key numbers in the space, not just from the investment perspective. So we look at like active wallets and those interacting with NFTs, and we're seeing an increase in all of those numbers, despite the fact that the Financial numbers are all dropping right now. What numbers do you guys see on your end? And can you share any of them? Is there an increase that you guys are seeing? Yeah. So we've seen a lot of growth in like one of the, the numbers that I track probably the closest is what are the RPC requests? What are the type of requests that are coming in? You know, in terms of talking to the blockchain, those requests will get by getting a lot more complex. People are doing more with them. There's more and more activity on the layer twos and the rollups, and there's more international growth for sure. I think some of the U.S. regulation is is increasingly pushing people overseas to from the U.S. And, and keep in mind that when I say that, there were lots of like companies in the space that were and DAOs and you know projects, whatever you want to call them, that were hosting their infrastructure in the U.S. Even though their teams were decentralized all over the world. Now they're starting to choose web hosts outside the U.S. So there's our reports that other people have made around what are called commits. So when developers push code to a project, it's called a commit. You can you know look at projects owned in the Ethereum ecosystem versus the SUI ecosystem versus the you know Phantom ecosystem, and look at you can track commits on tools like GitHub that can show you some really good data about where developers are going, who's building what. I think, you know, the conferences has been really good. Last year, last August, I was, you know, you're in Canada. I went to ETH Toronto. I was really, and the blockchain week that was happening there, blockchain futures week. It was really interesting to see that it wasn't just crypto bros there. It was like families learning about Web3. It was, you know, university students. It was people really from all races, all walks of life. That's a positive trend. I think that's more of a, a qualitative trend, not a quantifiable trend that you see at the mm -hmm. conferences increasingly, which is great to see that. All things that make me excited about the space, yeah. And since you're bringing up conferences, I know you're headed to ETH Paris. What is that? Two weeks? That's it? It's very, yeah. yeah, very soon. What are you looking forward to? What's Anchor doing there? Are you guys activating there at all? 
Yeah. So for us, we are having a little summit event with some partners. Outside of that, we're excited to just meet our customers, our partners. Web3 is very, you can be fully anon in the space, fully anonymous, no issues, but there is something that just about human nature when you meet your partners in person, you shake their hand, you buy them a drink, just like traditional business where it does help with trust. It helps get things done, helps partnerships advance. And so, you know, that is a really important thing about this space. And I, you know, some of our team, they have probably the majority of their friends are in Web3 and they meet them there. They, you know, you go to the, on the conference circuit, you meet all your friends and you have fun, you're building things together, you're working at a project, you also have something going on the side that you're working on. You know, it's very entrepreneurial in that sense. So I think that, you know, people that aren't builders should try to go to these conferences, meet up, develop, you know, network. People are very friendly and open and there's not, what I love about the Web3 conferences is there's not the stuffiness. Like people don't care about your title, where you work, they just want to know what your ambitions are and what you're passionate about. And so that's a very refreshing thing about these conferences. So I will say that whenever these conferences happen, there is a lot of people that go to these conferences that don't actually participate in the events. And so something that most people might not know is, you know, probably as obvious in hindsight is like a lot of deals are being made at these conferences. They're usually not happening like at the venue. They're happening like in some like private room or restaurant or bar or something. But, you know, most of the teams in this space, that's how you get business done. You go meet people, make things happen. Um, and uh, that's definitely important to be part of those conversations in, in the room, in those in, settings. In, so. in a space where we're building trustless and permissionless tech, we still need handshake trust. I think that's a, uh, a great point. One thing that I always say about the value of conferences right now is you can meet the most senior people in web three at a conference right now, yeah. three years from now, you won't be able to do that, right? Because right now yeah. it's still a very small community, right? There's not enough of us yet. So the opportunity, as you said, the op you know, you talked about the opportunity to be an entrepreneur and to build in web three. Well, if you go to one of these conferences, even if you didn't have an idea, if you just show up to one of these conferences and you walk around and you shake hands, you'll meet very senior people and you will get so many opportunities out of that. Exactly. I'd say probably like 10% of the people we've hired have come just from handshakes at conferences and, right. you know, meeting those people, they're like, I want to do this. I have these ideas and we're like, all right, you're on. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's go. It's so, in a decentralized remote team, it's amazing how different hiring and building teams is. We don't have all of these processes and steps that corporations have. And, you know, your startup, you're like, you want to do this? We like you. Let's start to go and let's, you know, and, and a lot of this starts as freelance work. I think people who come from the corporate world can often get almost ahead of themselves if they're trying to get work in Web3 and they feel like they need to go through the same process that they went through to get a job in their corporate job. But it's, you know, just show up to a conference, meet somebody and boom, you don't even, things are just going to happen real fast. Mm. I want to bring up a point that I was just thinking about this the other day. I think one of the reasons we haven't seen, say, San Francisco, Silicon Valley, or even New York really take like the lead in Web3, despite being so much talent there, is because a lot of the people that are in, you know, the last 10 years, we've seen so much consolidation of talent into like the thing type companies, you know, Facebook and Microsoft and Apple, right? And, you know, they are kind of like these golden handcuffs. They're making huge salaries over there. They're getting stock grants, right? And Web3 is inherently different. Working at Web3 is inherently different. Like there are some companies that have really great pay packages here. But I think what people don't realize is working at Web3, like the biggest opportunities are to be entrepreneurial set yourself while working for with mm -hmm. another project. That is an inherent quality an attribute of this space. And so I think naturally it attracts people that are looking to be entrepreneurial in this space. For someone that has like a big comfy job, it's it's harder to transition into Web3. And I think that's one reason we've seen this like decentralization in the activity and the energy in the space. It's a great point. Okay, I want to uh, touch on Anchor recently. I think it was about a month ago that you guys launched your partnership or announced your partnership with Microsoft and Tencent, which is a big deal to be 
highlighting these Web2 companies and enabling more enterprises, more of the Web2. And we talk so much about what is going to be the onboarding ramp for the next billion users. Like, How do we get them in? And I think that a lot of us kind of thought that it would be building new businesses and new use cases. But really, the on-ramp often will be Web2 companies and existing companies utilizing blockchain and bringing it into their business. And this partnership seems to be a partnership that's going to enable that. Can you tell us more about it? Yeah. So our partnership with both, in terms of Microsoft and Tencent, we're partnering with their cloud divisions in their infrastructure division. So Microsoft is doing a lot of other things outside of, they own it, obviously, everything from gaming to Windows and, and whatnot. But we're very focused on the cloud sector. And, you know, cloud computing, you know, most enterprises and businesses on the planet use Microsoft for something. Mm -hmm. And so they have been an amazing partner. They, By the way, Microsoft in particular has had a blockchain strategy for like six or seven years now. Uh, they were doing stuff in blockchain like 2015, uh, have been a big supporters of the space in various ways, researching this, figuring it out. And so uh, what we're trying to do with this is is really make it easy for their enterprises to consume high performance infrastructure nodes, uh, launch an application chain with us. So the reality is, is that, you know, Anchor is still very much like a startup in the space. And for us to work with some of the you know, governments talk about app, national app chains and things like that. We have to have a partner that has really all the levels of security and, you know, all the different systems that like a Microsoft would have. And so in particular, Microsoft has been a great partner because of their enterprise access and we're partnering with their client. They're introducing us to what companies we would never really have access to outside of that partnership. And then with Tencent in particular, Tencent is like a very, is really big in Southeast Asia, in China with gaming. And so with our gaming SDKs and whatnot, Tencent is really a leading force. And I don't think us in North America realize like how big gaming is in China and how big Tencent is. Like it is the leader in Southeast Asia in that sense and in, in the Chinese community. And so now uh, that partnership is very much in the same where we're working with them to get those gaming companies into the Web3 space and with you know, Web3 infrastructure. So the reality is, is that they've already done the hard work of getting companies onto their platforms. And so by us being, making our services available, it lowers the barrier of entry for those, you know, for those companies, makes it faster for them to get into Web3, which ultimately helps with mass adoption and, you know, onboarding literally billions of users. So there are companies, you know, I will say, like Anchor, we don't have access to a billion users yet, but there's companies that we can work with with Tencent and Microsoft that do have access to literally a billion users that we're in, currently in talks with right now. So it's a great point. Uh, that's really exciting and an important thing. And I think, you know, when we first announced this, I think there was a little bit of skepticism. I saw some like FUD on Twitter about it, but like, what does mass adoption mean? It means you're going to be part of it with these companies. Like they're yeah. not going anywhere. <laughs> That's totally. what it means. <laughs> and that's why like there needs to be this balance between the decentralization maxis and we all want to get to a better internet. We value open source. We value all these things. We also, we need to be realistic in the manner in which we get there and the phased approach that's going to need to happen. You mentioned national app chains and working with governments. What does that mean? Can you frame that for us? Yeah. So without saying too much, have a lot of you know, NDAs in place right now, we are exploring with several governments what national app chains look right now. And some of them are interested in launching a stable coin in their country as a regulated mm -hmm. stable coin. There's other mechanisms to bring like a, a regulated DeFi into certain countries as well using a national app chain. We definitely feel like app chains are the future. So we're going into a world where Inevitably, we're, we're probably only have, there'll be hundreds of layer ones, but the layer ones of consequence in the space, like the Ethereum's, the world, Polygon, more or less, is still layer one in my in my mind, probably have dozens of those that really take the majority of the market share. And then everything else is going to live in kind of this layer two in this app chain world. So I think we're going into a world where we'll see thousands, if not tens of thousands, maybe even someday hundreds of thousands of application chains mm -hmm. be run. And so Anchor really is the leader in the application chain. And 
you know, we're seeing great success with that around the world. I think you very accurate in that that is the way it will go as governments want to build on blockchain, make, having their own chain that they can control an environment around makes a lot of sense. And then companies doing the same thing, I can definitely see that. Okay. I want to get to a speed round, but before we do anything else you want to share about Anchor, floor is yours to show. Also, where can people find you? I know you're going to be at ECC, but where can people find you online where they can connect with you guys? I love to connect with people on my Twitter, which is at Josh Duroth. My DMs are open. You know, people can send me a DM there. I don't, you know, leak alpha or things like that, but I love to have conversations around, you know, technologies, where things are going. So very approachable. Love to use that as a resource. Probably won't be using threads anytime soon. Still, we'll stick to Twitter for now. Okay. Nice. We'll include your Twitter handle in the show notes for those who want to find you. Okay. Speed round. Got three questions for you, Josh. First one, what's one prediction you have for the rest of this year? Yeah, so probably a generic prediction, but I I do think the market will continually head up this year. Obviously, my own personal opinion, I think the Bitcoin happening hanging out there in early 2024 has a lot to do with that. And we've had like six months of like the markets like well which what direction are we going to go the rate at which the institutions are coming back into this space right now is really unprecedented so pending any world apocalypse events like i think the market will definitely be increasing that is a great positive outlook and thank you for that we completely agree one thing you've bought recently for under 100 dollars that brings you joy does not have to be a digital or oh, man. You know what? Working in Web3 is like an around the clock thing. I, whenever I talk to my friends that aren't in this space, they're like shocked by, you know, how many times there's calls at like four in the morning, or one in the morning, or things like that. And I found a lot of joy in doing some offline like builder projects, like with my hands lately. I recently bought a Brad Nailer. It shoots these little pin nails into things. Oh, yeah, I got a Brad Nailer. Nice. <laughs> yeah, it's just made my life great. So, <laughs> well, nice building. Yeah. Well, I built uh, basically a tiny house in my backyard as my office. I'm not currently in it. I don't have my AC hooked up and it's like 90 degrees Fahrenheit here in New York right now, or I don't know what that is in Celsius, but it's really hot. So yeah. as soon as I get the AC hooked up, I'll be back out there. But uh, Brad Nailer was definitely helpful in that project. Amazing. I am in my tiny house right now in my backyard and I don't have AC in here. It's not, it doesn't get as hot here here on the West Coast, but the sun is currently coming in and uh, I'm cooking in here. It's a bit of a greenhouse, so I should probably get AC. Okay. Last question. If you had a billboard that 1 billion people were going to see, what would you write on it? (laughs) It's going to be a little controversial, but something not associated with Web3 There's this really interesting theory I've been researching around. This is going to sound crazy to some people. You'll think I'm a lunatic for saying this, which is why I think it should be on a billboard, but how the Great Pyramids of Egypt were used as a power plant. And I would say something like, there's so many great YouTube videos that have really done their research and there's people that are starting to really take this theory seriously. So I think the more people should see that. That's a really interesting thing. It's out there. So probably something about the Great Pyramid Power can Plant you, Theory. Can you explain that theory in the Yeah. So there's something theory. about how there's like water erosion under the Great Pyramids where at one point people know that, you know, scientists or geologists, I should say, archaeologists know that there was water running under them. And obviously the precision of how these things were built, there's nothing parallel to it today. And so the top was gold, which is a conductor. If you remember some of the stuff that, you know, Tesla, the inventor invented with his DC current, where Mm -hmm. effectively the atmosphere could be charged to bring electricity to people. People think that the Great Pyramids were used to do that. And there's hieroglyphics in Egypt of people holding what look to be light bulbs, not torches. So it's too easy for us to assume that we, the technologies we have today have never been used in the past. And you look at this precision where we can't really even replicate it today with the Great Pyramid and you have to wonder, you know, was it used for something else? So I enjoy as a side hobby, researching that kind of stuff, seeing what people have to say about it. There's some really interesting theories out there. You're a a multi rabbit hole guy. You just, (laughs) you just said half of our listeners down the most random YouTube rabbit hole, the Great Pyramid. 
<laughs> well, the thing is, is like all the people in academia hate these theories, which makes me love it more. I'm kind right. of a rebel at heart. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're in Web3. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Josh, this has been just a, a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for sharing all your thoughts. Thank you for everything you're building at Anchor. We need that infrastructure, as you said. We need better user experience if we're going to get to a billion users in the space and beyond that. And I know that that is a big focus of you guys. So deep bow. Uh, we'll definitely have to get you back on the show again in the future. I think uh, yeah. you've got a great outlook on the space. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening in, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to Web3 Academy, your one trusted source to capitalize on the next big phase of the internet. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and subscribe or follow so that you don't miss the next one. While you're at it, there's a link in the description for our free newsletter where we provide timely and relevant Web3 insights so you can confidently build and invest in Web3. Make sure to subscribe today. One final note. This podcast is for educational purposes only and nothing we say is financial advice. Crypto and Web3 are risky and you should never invest more than you're willing to lose. Thank you, friends, and see you in the next one.